What are stories about picture-perfect families who do effed-up stuff behind closed doors? Guy I went to high school with had what looked to be a perfect family. He was a football star, mom and dad were successful, and they even had a white picket fence around their house. One day, he and his brother come home to find mom and dad dead in the driveway. His dad was cheating, the mom found out, and waited till he got home. Shot and killed him, then shot herself. In the driveway, no less. Effed up. I had a friend in high school whose family would lock every door in their house. I mean every door. If there was a door, it would be locked and the key hidden somewhere in the house. I don't know if they were afraid of home invasion or what, but it was crazy and took forever just to navigate the house. For instance, to get to the guest bathrooms, you'd have to open the hallway door with a key hidden on the windowsill in the living room. Then, under the left-hand corner of the hallway carpet was the key to open the linen closet. Finally, in the linen closet, under a stack of towels on the second shelf from the bottom would be the key to open the bathroom. It was like that for every friggin' door. Multiple keys to open multiple doors to get to the right key to open the room you wanted to get into. Even the fridge was chained and locked with a key. My friend asked me to sleep over once. Once. I never went back. These twin girls I knew from middle school were really nice, polite, had straight A's, did community service, and were overall pretty well-rounded. Their parents seemed relatively normal and supportive. Later found out that the parents would make the girls stand on their heads until they passed out if they got a bad grade or acted out in any way. A friend of mine and her family slash family friends back in her state are involved with a lot of foster care. Her family has a couple of foster kids at the moment, I think. Basically, one of her family friends who also takes foster kids in had this one Iranian kid. He was adopted on the side by a really normal upper-middle-class white Australian family, except he was also kept in a cage in their shed as a dog. Their entire family was really pleasant and completely normal. Their other biological children were also completely fine. They were discovered when the grandmother of that family came to visit and asked what the barking was, went to the shed, and found the child in a cage barking madly. When the grandmother asked what the hell was happening, the parents of the family just responded with, Oh, he's just the dog. Ignore him. She obviously reported it, and now my family babysits for the child every so often. He's pretty normal now, but he has really awful reactions to certain sounds. They ended up contacting the biological mother, who was some Iranian girl who lived with her family, but she didn't want to know anything about it as long as he was okay now. The people who currently take care of him are convinced that it was a child of S abuse slash R after seeing the mother's reaction, but eh, they can't really say anything, I guess. My wife's family are the worst people I have ever met. When she was younger, she was seriously depressed and still is. She attempted self-termination by taking a fistful of pills. Her mom found her passed out on the living room floor next to the bottle of pills and rushed her to the ER. The doctor asked why she was passed out and why she was here at the ER and her mom wouldn't tell them that she took a bunch of pills, just kept saying, I don't know what's wrong with her to keep up the whole, my family wouldn't do that kind of thing. After we got married, they kept giving us advice along the lines of, if you want to have a perfect marriage like we do, you must do this, this, and this. Then they get a divorce. I effing hate those people. I had a really sweet friend in high school. I'd been to church with her family. We'd been really great friends. She made excellent grades, was commander of the ROTC squadron appointed by the instructors, and much, much more. During the brief time we were dating, she confided in me that her father periodically arred her starting on her 15th birthday, and that he'd done the same thing to her older sister for her 15th birthday. I didn't ask why, I was just kinda left numb at that point. She revealed to me that she was pregnant and that her father had scheduled her an abortion within the week because it was 99% certainly his. Her older sister had to have a hysterectomy because apparently he was especially rough with her and caused massive internal trauma. Typing it on here did seem so tame. Honestly, the conversation we had was visceral and emotional, unlike anything we'd ever had before. She screamed, I screamed, she cried, I held her, and she cried some more. Eventually, she cried herself to sleep and ended up napping at my place for a few hours while I just sat at the foot of my bed crying cried like a baby that night. Andrew Jarecki initially was going to make a film about children's birthday party entertainers in New York, including the popular clown David Friedman. 
During his research, Jarecki learned that David Friedman's brother Jesse and his father Arnold had been convicted of child S abuse. Jarecki interviewed some of the children involved and ended up making a film focusing on the Friedmans. The investigation into Arnold Friedman's life started after a federal sting operation when he received a magazine of child pornography from the Netherlands by mail. In searching his Great Neck New York home, investigators found a collection of child pornography. After learning that Friedman taught children computer classes from his home, local police began to suspect him of abusing his students. In police interviews, some of the children Friedman taught stated Friedman played bizarre s games with them during their computer classes. Jarecki interviewed some of these children himself. Some stated that they had been in the room with other children alleging abuse and that nothing had happened. The film portrayed police investigation procedures as the genesis of a witch hunt in the Friedman's community. The Friedman took home videos while Arnold Freeman and later his son Jesse awaited trial. They were allowed to stay at home in order to prepare for court. The pictures were not made with publishing in mind, but as a way to record what was happening in their lives. The movie shows much of this footage, family dinners, conversations, and arguments. Arnold's wife quickly decided that her husband was indeed guilty and advised him to confess and protect their son. Arnold Friedman pleaded guilty to multiple charges of sodomy and s abuse. According to the Friedman family, he confessed in hopes that his son would be spared prison time. Jesse Friedman later confessed as well, but now claims he did so to avoid being sent to prison for life. He said in mitigation that his father had molested him. Arnold Friedman admitted to molesting two boys, but not those who attended his computer classes. He is also quoted as admitting that when he was 13, he did it with his younger brother Howard, who was eight years old at the time of the abuse. Howard Friedman has says he does not recall this. Arnold Friedman committed self-termination in prison in 1995, leaving a $250,000 life insurance benefit to his son. Jesse Friedman was released from prison in 2001 after serving 13 years of his sentence. When I was in school, there was one girl who epitomized all-American girl-next-door cheerleader. She was gorgeous, with blue eyes, long blonde hair, perfect body, and always this 100-watt smile. She was on homecoming court, and so was her little sister. Her family was prominent locally. The stay-at-home mom ran the PTA, the dad had a prestigious job. This girl was on a parent-imposed diet since at least third grade when I met her, despite never being fat. If she or her sister sassed her parents or got less than a B-plus on an assignment, they were told they were dogs and they were forced to crawl around the house and eat their food from dog bowls under the kitchen table. There was a brother-sister pair at my high school. Their parents were divorced and the dad was a little weird, but he coached Little League and was known as a generally good dad. The kids were amazing, super popular, but because they were amazing people, not because they were mean. Everyone loved their mom, too. She was a mother figure to a lot of kids at school. And then one Friday, the brother and sister didn't show up at school, and they stopped responding to texts. A group of their friends decided to drop by their house and looked through the window and saw the dad on the floor shot through the head. Apparently, he was bipolar and had shot his two kids in the head while they were sleeping next to each other on the couch, then shot the wife's dog, who was staying with them, then himself. None of us ever understood exactly what happened or why he did it, but our small school wasn't quite the same for a very long time after that. I have never heard a more profound silence on campus than I did that Monday morning. On the outside, my friend's family have a huge mansion, are eloquent, driving expensive cars, wear expensive suits, are all attending Ivy League schools or graduated from an Ivy League school. In the inside, it is a whole different story. My friend is sleeping with his dad's girlfriend who is planning on marrying. His dad is 52, this girl is 25, and my friend is 20. His dad and brother didn't know and still do not know. He tells me that he is not just doing this because he finds her attractive, but to get back at his dad for barely spending any time with him. Apparently, his dad told him that he couldn't spend any time because he had a lot of work to do, but somehow has enough time to go on a one-month vacation in Europe with his girlfriend. Please like and subscribe if you've made it this far. I hope you'll enjoy the rest of the video and have a wonderful day. My hubby's uncle's family was that perfect straight-laced Mormon family. 
family of seven, church every Sunday, well-behaved kids, etc. One Thanksgiving Day, things blew up in front of the whole family. Long story short, family was arguing about some things, and the end of the day turned out to be people screaming, and one of his nephews strangling him. My hubby had to rip him off his uncle. After that incident, all these stories began to unravel. Apparently, his uncle was abusive toward his children and wife. She was having an affair with someone half her age. She would sneak guys into her house and have her oldest daughter watch to make sure her husband wasn't coming home. Also, there were rumors of the dad, hubby's uncle, having an affair with his own stepdaughter. Also, the oldest boy in the family would go around flashing his thang to his little sisters. Sad. Just sad. His youngest daughters are such sweethearts, too. This was in quite a big town a couple of years ago, so there was this one guy. He was pretty religious, everybody knew him, and the good guy, but at home, he would R his own daughter. She was about 18 or 19, and her mother knew but couldn't do anything about it. So one day, the father gets his daughter pregnant and realizes he is effed, so he looks up on the internet how to remove the kid from his daughter's stomach and buys the tools needed. He then proceeds to get his daughter and try the things he learned, and she died during the process. The media then caught the news, and everybody knew, and the father was sent to jail, and his family were living in a huge mess after that. Applies to my family, for sure. I was a valedictorian of my senior class, editor-in-chief of my high school yearbook, and early decision acceptance of Northwestern. My dad was a VP, drove a BMW, and we lived in the nicest gated neighborhood in town. Everybody assumed our family was perfect until I abruptly moved out six months before graduation. No one knew what an insane, controlling freak my dad secretly was. In high school, I gained some weight after the death of a close friend, about 20 pounds. Dad put me on a weight loss or punishment program. I had to lose three pounds a week in order to not be grounded. At first, I kept up, but it got to be too much. Eventually, it was cumulative as well, so if I only lost two one week, it was four the next. I was so ashamed, I never told anyone until it got to be too much to handle, and I broke down to my girlfriend at the time. Dad didn't know I was a lesbian either. She told me he was insane and that I was well within a healthy weight range. Even though she was a health nut marathon runner, I didn't believe her until she showed me on a BMI calculator. When I confronted my dad about being done with the program, he said, You're not done. I don't know what weight you need to be at, but I'll know it when I see it. Thanks, Dad, for all the years of body image issues and the many more to come. This is my life right now. On the outside, well-educated, nice family with a working dad, a stay-at-home mom, and two smart, nice kids. In private, we're up to our ears in debt. My mom is only stay-at-home because her last job ruined her both mentally and physically because of stress and abuse from her bosses. My dad is stressed out of his mind because of our problems. My brother and I can't concentrate on our schoolwork when we know that as soon winter comes for real, we'll sleep in 6 degrees Celsius rooms because our heating doesn't work and we can't afford to replace it. We were royally screwed by the dealer selling it to us. And because our problems by now are way too big for us to handle, we all just ignore them and go about our day, when in reality we can't afford the food we eat every day and try to ignore the calls and letters from the banks and tax people. Slash rant, too long didn't read, we're far up Crap Creek. Both of my parents' families are effed up. They both come from very old, wealthy families. They have the kind of names that will get you into a country club totally going around the decade-long wait list. They were both born into the social registry, which is the list of old money people in the U.S. My grandfather on my mother's side was an extreme alcoholic. The problem with being rich and being an alcoholic is that you don't end up on the street begging for more alcohol. Instead, you just end up dead. He convinced my grandmother to drop out of an Ivy League school to live with him at his crap school. While there, he got so drunk that he was in a coma for two months. After having three kids and living off his mother's cash, he decided to start having an open affair with a German prostitute. I say open because who knows how many affairs happened prior to this one. My grandmother acted like there was nothing wrong, but they did get divorced when he refused to even hide his mistress from the kids. And when my mother asked for college book money, he wasn't paying for any of the tuition, even though he inherited millions, 
he refused because it would set a bad precedent of the kid asking for money from the parents. Keep in mind, he has been living off his mother's money his entire life. My father's family was a bit worse. From what I have gathered, my grandfather inherited millions from his parents. He was also an extreme alcoholic. He beat my father, his mother, and his sister. He sent my father off to boarding school, and all of his wrath went to my aunt, who I haven't seen in 15 years because she thinks my father left her when he was shipped off. I don't know much about the family, but what I do know is that at one point when I was five, my grandfather came to our house and drunkenly stole our curtains. I don't know why. My father has implied that he is dead, but they never went to a funeral, and there is no record of his death. To all appearances, my wife and I were a pretty well-perfect couple. We went everywhere together, and she was always the life of the party. Behind closed doors, she was pretty much a lunatic with wild mood swings and insane, I mean literally insane depression that would lead to her talking about wanting to die. She was pretty drug dependent. If it wasn't pills, it was booze. There's other stuff too, but that's the big thing. She eventually got sick and ended up committing self-termination due to being physically ill and feeling hopeless about that. Everyone was baffled how this could happen and how someone so seemingly happy and intense could just kill themselves. But really, I wasn't so much surprised as shocked. It was over three years ago, so I'm really pretty much over it and all that. But every time I see a happy person, I wonder, are they really happy or do they go home and talk about how they want to die? Too long didn't read, seemingly perfect couple, but one of them is insane and ends up dying. Please leave your story in the comments. I would love to make a video on them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.